Hey students, welcome back. Happy Tuesday. Let's get started with life science class. All right. Here we go. You're watching the video lesson for Tuesday, April 7th. First, I want to start out by doing something really that I think is uh, so interesting to me. Um, we're finishing up, we just finished up now with the variety of animals and how we classify them. Um, so I want to give you maybe one more tool that might help you understand how they are organized better. Um, this is something that, this is a method of studying that helps me learn more about my subject matter. And I hope that you find that it's one of your strengths. You just never know what you're interested in. So I want to present the information to you this way. So bear with me, here we go. We're gonna study the meaning of the names of the major phyla that you just learned about. Uh, and let's, let's give it a shot, I'll show you. So phylum periphera, they're sponges, right? Remember how they're really networks, open networks, most of them? Well, the root word of periphera is porous. Porous means poor or opening. Periphera, porous creatures, see? This science is called etymology. It's the study of the origin of words. So let's keep going and see if you start to like it. Nadaria, those were the jellyfish, sea anemones, hydra and corals. Now all these creatures are stinging creatures, even the tiny little polyps from the corals. They're all stinging creatures. Well, nadaria, that word comes from the root word need. Uh, nadi, which means nettle. You know, a nettle is something sticky and stinging and pokey and uh, harmful. They hurt. Nettles hurt. Well, nadaria, if you can think of nadi, nadaria, nettles, you'll remember these are all stinging creatures. Let's do some more. How about platyhelminthus? These are flatworms. Well, the word platy actually means flat. And the word helminth really means worm. So how about platy helminth? This is flatty worms, flat worms, platy, flatty. See how this works? Etymology is great. I hope that this will intrigue you and it may build a strength in you in the future. All right, mollusca. That word mollusca means, oh, it comes from the root word mollus. Mollus means soft. Do you remember snails, slugs, clams, mussels, octopi, squid? These are all soft-bodied creatures, aren't they? Mollusk means soft. Mollusca, soft-bodied. Annelida, earthworms, leeches, marine worms. Um, they're all segmented bodies. Remember, all those segments have a set of organs that do their specific job. Well, the word annelida comes from annulus, which means little ring. Not just one ring, little ring, meaning several little rings. Annelida, those creatures are several little rings put together. They're segmented. How about arthropoda? These are insects, spiders, lobsters, and centipedes, and they don't sound like they have hardly anything in common, right? But arthron, the root word, means a joint, and podus means feet, jointed feet. See, arthropoda, jointed feet. These creatures all have jointed legs. It makes sense. How about echinoderma? Echinoder echinodermata. I do that every time. Echinodermata. These are starfish, sea cucumbers, and sea urchins. Well, all of these creatures have spiny or bumpy, bumpy outer coverings, don't they? The name echinodermata. Echino means spiny, and derma is skin. Spiny skin, these are spiny skinned creatures. All right, chordata. Um, those are fish, reptiles, amphibians, birds, mammals. Um, corda is the root word there. Corda really means cord or string. Do you remember the nota cord was one of the four characteristics of all chordates in this phylum? So see, chordata has the root word corda, meaning cord, and you can think of that as contains vertebrates, um, and they all have a nota cord. Great, well I hope that you will enjoy that kind of study the way I enjoy it, and I'm certain that if you'll look back over this list, it will help make more sense about categorizing animals when we do a couple of our fun activities later in our Zoom sessions. Okay, let's get going. Welcome, folks. 
Now we're in chapter 12. We're going to talk about animal structure and function. So chapter 11, we tried to figure out how to best classify animals. Well, now chapter 12 is really all about figuring out how they work, how they do what they do. All right. Well, um, something that man has seen. Oh, uh, put this in your notes. I'm sorry. So the new section the whole new section is called Animal Structure and Function. The first section was Animal Classification. This is Animal Structure and Function. Here's your first subsection, Animal Structure and Function. We're going to put this word in your notes. Biomimicry, very important to know. Biomimicry just means, um, oh, the word bio is life, right? Mimicry means to copy, copying life. What humans are seeing now is that there is such an incredible benefit in looking into how animals work and finding the wisdom that God has already put there and using it for our benefit. Um, for example, you remember the ostrich video? Ostriches, tiny little brains, right? Even the scripture said, well, God didn't endow them with much wisdom, but what he did endow them with was amazing legs. They're the fastest creatures on two legs. And we saw that ostrich chase off a whole pack of hyenas, one ostrich stomp on the leader and protected his, his family, right? One ostrich did that. Um, fast and strong legs, incredible. Well, biomimicry, humans are doing that. We're looking at the forms of animals around us and how they operate, and we're trying to gain some benefit from them. Let me give you some examples. All right, the mosquito and surgical needles. Nothing in common, right? But we realized that um, uh, research at Kansai University in Japan realized mosquitoes sting they sting painlessly. Well, wow, why can't we do that in the medical world? Why can't we deliver medicines that way? Um, so they're developing a three-pronged needle that works like a mosquito sting. Um, the mosquito sting actually vibrates um, and it has three prongs and then the central needle goes in painlessly. So this surgical needle is doing just that. It vibrates like the mosquito's um, proboscis does and it, makes, uh, it decreases the pain of a shot. Okay, here we go. How about an albatross and a drone? An albatross is a big seabird. Albatross are known to be able to glide. They use very little energy, but they can cover up to 600 miles in a day, rarely flapping. They are just built to glide and sail on the wind. Wow, amazing. How about making a drone like that? If a drone could be made like that, it could use very little fuel and it could have an incredible far reach, right? Well, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, is working on just such a drone and that's a picture of it. All right, how about fireflies? Fireflies, their lanterns, they um, have asymmetrical pyramids all along the surface of their lanterns. And um, researchers at Penn State are realizing wow, that form, those little bumps across the surface of the firefly's lantern really extract so much more light. So they're using it to change LED light bulbs. And so far they're discovering, gosh, changing the surface of the LED light bulb to have those asymmetrical pyramids, just like the firefly, increases the light output up to 90% extraction of light. Wow, amazing improvement, right? How about biomimicry from the elephant trunk? An elephant um, can retract and expand and extend and bend its trunk in any way. The German company Festo right now is working on a bionic arm, a robotic arm patterned right after an elephant trunk to give it maximum flexibility and maximum strength. That is biomimicry in action. Um, there are so many more examples around us. So let's now look specifically at animals. And first we're gonna study how they uh, body support, control, and movement. So this is the next subsection for your notes. Underline that. We're going to build into that now. Body support, control, and movement. And we're going to, oh, this means, oh, I need to tell you something. I need to tell you about this. That's what I get for not using my notes. Let me use my notes. Okay, so come with me now and let's think. We'll compare fish and bears. Both of them need oxygen. Fish live in water. Bears live on, the, on land. They both need oxygen for cellular respiration, right? To so keep all of their life activities going. Well, fish have gills so that they can extract oxygen from the water. Bears have lungs to extract oxygen from the air. 
They are different animals and they have different organs, but they are accomplishing the same thing. They're obtaining oxygen. So this should go in your notes. Animals in different habitats have different structures that perform similar functions like obtaining food, water, and oxygen. All animals need food, water, and oxygen. You'll see that based on their habitat, they're built particular ways. All right, first section, let's talk about A, structures for support. Structures for support. The first type of structure that supports an animal is uh, the endoskeleton. Let's talk about animals with endoskeletons. Those are mammals, fish, birds, um, a whole assortment. What you want to think about when you're thinking of an endoskeleton really is the word uh, prefix endo. Endo means inside, internal, within, in, endo. It's an endo inside skeleton. An, in, an endoskeleton is a hard internal support structure. Um, that would support internal organs and that would provide um, uh, help to provide movement of the animal. All right, if the animal is a vertebrate, then that would include its backbone. But we can't think of endoskeletons as only being made of bone. Do you remember the shark? Look at the shark on the picture. Um, sharks, the entire skeleton inside is really made of cartilage. Even the backbone is cartilage. Cartilage is that more flexible um, protein. It's very stiff and tough, but it's also more flexible than bone. Um, so we can't think of an endoskeleton really as always being made of, of, of lots of calcium like our skeletons are. Um, some, like the shark, are made of cartilage, but still an endoskeleton nonetheless because they are achieving the same goals to support the, the animal and to help provide movement. All right, pause the video and take that note if you need to. Let's move on to the next type of structure that we see in the animals, um, and that would be exoskeletons. This is number two, exoskeletons. All phylum arthropoda contain, have exoskeletons, um, and some nematodes, uh, most nematodes. All right, an exoskeleton really is not, it's neither uh, Bone, like our bone is made mostly of calcium, and it's neither cartilage, which is a protein. Exoskeletons of these creatures are made from, really, they're polysaccharides, so it's a different molecule, but they're hard nonetheless. It's a hard outer covering that also achieves the same goal. It provides protection and support for the internal organs. Um, now, Exoskeletons don't grow as the animal grows. Uh, endoskeletons do, exoskeletons don't do that. So animals that have exoskeletons um, must molt. They must shed the outer skeleton from time to time so that they can grow. So they really are gonna grow out of their exoskeleton and replace it with another. I have at the bottom of this page a video of a crab molting. So if you would pause, that video and go to that website, that would be great, or you can watch it afterwards. I have that video linked in RenWeb already for you. All right, let's move on. The last structure that we'll see in animals for support is called a hydrostatic skeleton. And these are for earthworms, jellyfish, sea anemones. Let me focus your attention first on those funny pictures of those surgical gloves that are filled with water. Um, think of the glove before it was filled with water. Well, it was just flat. Um, and if we put glitter inside, we could squish the glitter, right? But once we fill the glove with water, now the glove feels firm. It's flexible, but firm, right? The glitter inside, it's more protected. That is what a hydrostatic skeleton does, really. The word hydro means water, and static means stabilizing. So you can think of a hydrostatic skeleton in an animal like a hydroskeleton. Um, internal fluids fill an organism's colon. That's an internal cavity. And that cavity is surrounded by muscle. Let me show you the pictures at the bottom. I'll get a laser pointer. All right, here we have an earthworm on the left side. Oh, I think it's your left side. Um, these spaces here are the colon. They're separate and they're surrounded by muscle 
Um, the colon there for the earthworm is filled with internal fluids and they can be expanded and contracted using the muscle around it. Same thing with the jellyfish. Look at this large internal space for the jellyfish, mostly water, right? The jellyfish fills up this space and it makes him look nice and firm and full. And we'll talk more about um, how a jellyfish actually uses this fluid to help it move, but that's in the next uh, couple sections. Okay, now we're ready to talk about structures for body control. This is B, structures for body control. Let me, let me try to follow my notes. All right, when we're talking about body control, what we're really talking about here is an animal's nervous system. An animal's nervous system um, means that it's the body parts that enable an animal to sense things around it or inside it, and then react. Um, it's what would help them recognize um, whether or not danger is near, and it would help them realize whether or not it's hungry, and then it, uh, the nervous system would help the animal to move and go find food somewhere, or to move and get away from that danger or defend itself. Um, let's think of humans. We understand our nervous systems um, as including a brain. And our brain is like a central processing and control center um, for our sensations and for all our actions in the body, right? But you now know, you've learned in studying the major phyla that um, some animals don't have brains. So how do their bodies operate without a brain? What tells their body parts to move? How do they know when they're touching something nearby that is either delicious and they should grab it or dangerous and they should get away from it? Um, what helps them interpret that information? Well, we'll see here too that different animals have different nervous systems to accomplish the very same goals like avoiding danger, finding food, moving here and there. So let's get these two points into your notes. Nervous system, the body part that enables an animal to sense and react. It helps them find, it helps them move, find food and avoid harm. Also in your notes, please put this one. Different animals have different nervous systems that perform similar functions. All right, let me focus your attention over to the nerve cell there. That's a picture of a nerve cell, which is a neuron. There are many types of nerve cells, but in general, the nerve cell, the neurons, they all accomplish the same thing. They are the cells that generate signals and they help to transmit signals, um, impulses that are really messages and commands. We're gonna be talking about nerve cells, neurons. I'm gonna mention that. And we're gonna talk about them because now we're gonna list the two types of structures for animal body control. These are the structures that we're gonna see in animals that help to control the animal's body. One is gonna be nerve net, two is nerve cord. Let's do nerve, nerve net first. Let me check my time. Okay. Structures for body control continued. One is the nerve net. These are, for, these are in jellyfish, coral, and sea anemone. All right, you see the representation of a nerve net on the, on the hydra there? A nerve net is, is just like a net-like system that spans the entire body of the organism. It's not organized around a brain. There's no central um, deposit or location of many neurons um, that are in command or in control. These, uh, the animals that have nerve nets are animals with radial symmetry and no brain. Um, nerve nets operate uh, incredibly fast, yes, but slightly slower than uh, a nervous system with a nerve cord because rather than a brain that uh, is controlling and commanding, each of the nerve each of the spaces where these uh, neurons interact, they're gonna process there, and then they're gonna send the signal to the next section that also has to reprocess. So it's a slight, slightly slower than a, a nervous system with a nerve cord. All right, 
structures with nerve cords. Okay, what kind of animals have nerve cords in their nervous systems? Those would be zebras, birds, alligators, dogs, lots and lots of animals. A nerve cord is just that, is a central cord, or it could be two cords of neurons that are connected long ways, end to end, that enable signals to move between a brain and all the neurons that branch out in the body. Those are the nerves, all the other neurons in the body. Animals with bilateral symmetry and brains or brain-like structures have nerve cords. Um, in vertebrates, remember the nerve cord is called, it is called the spinal cord. Um, and as I said, the nerve cord will actually operate faster than a nerve net. All right, here we go. Hey, that's the end of the video. Fantastic. Nice job. I'll see you later in Zoom. Bye-bye.